has taught uh, students for decades and decades. The last eight years, he has been a professor at the Applied uh, University of Applied Sciences in Bochum, Germany. And um, I am pleased to say that he will be retired, well, not really retiring, he will be moving full time to Camden by the end of the summer, so there, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy about that because I'm also married to him. Not bad, not bad. Um, so there will be more to come uh, in learning about mystics, learning perhaps about um, other challenges and invitations of this faith journey, um, always presented in a very creative and often unconventional way. Mark is also a, a a prolific poet, a seminar leader, translator, also of um, like Rainer Maria Rilke, Hilde Domin, German speaking poets into English, and has done a wonderful job with that. He's also an editor. And I do want to point out that there are books for sale that Mark has written or co authored. They're on the back table there. They'll be available during the break, during lunch, after. And Mark, of course, will be glad to sign them for you. Um, um, you may best during lunch, he said, or afterwards. So we hope that you take some time to peruse those. Now, without uh, further ado, though, uh, let me turn all of this to Mark so that we can begin our learning together. Thank you very much, Uta. And thank you, Elizabeth, for recording this for posterity. <laughs> And as Ruta mentioned, the institution I've been uh, associated with for the last eight years, it sounds a little odd to American ears, the University of Applied Sciences. There are two kinds of universities in Germany, the pure research and universities in which research is applied to living. And Eckhart would love that because he would say the only wisdom, the only knowledge worth knowing is knowledge applied to your life, which is wisdom, which is different than knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And I think that's why, that's why I'm here today, and I suspect that's why you are all here today, because you've been drawn either by Eckhart, some of you will know a little about Eckhart, I will assume that some of you know nothing about Eckhart, and for all of us, it would help just to, for the first 45 minutes or so, to sketch a little bit of his life, which was a very interesting life in a time not unlike our own, a time of transition, a time of great tension, a time of growth, which uh, left uh, many people extraordinarily wealthy, uh, some people, I should say, and, and many struggling to find their way in a, a really the emerging consumer society of an emerging Europe in the 13th and early 14th century. Why do we come back to Eckhart? I think in part because he is outrageous. And I mean that as a high compliment. He confuses and puzzles us to pry us loose from what we thought we knew to create a space within us for a larger, truer, deeper knowing. And one of the best ways to do that is to startle people, to jostle us a little bit. And I mean all of us not just those who don't know what's going on. Eckhart would say none of us really knows what's going on, and that's a good thing. Because as soon as we know what's going on, we close ourselves off to most of what actually is in the world. All of our assumptions and prejudices. And so Eckhart was not conventionally religious in the sense that he didn't simply t teach what the church had taught. He tried to startle people into seeing something deeper and truer and he would have used the word nobler, which in his society was a high praise. To be a noble person was the highest one could aspire to. Someone who gave their life not for themselves, but for the sake of others. And really that was his whole point, was to help us realize that the, the, the task is not to become a contemplative. The task is to integrate our active lives in the depths of what is real and what is true. He coined a word for that in high medieval German, which today is a common word, Wirklichkeit. Wirklichkeit today, if you say, what does Wirklichkeit mean? Some of you are German speakers. Well, you say it's reality. 
But for Eckhart, it had a particular, and it was a word he invented. It didn't exist in German before his time. He wanted to say with Wirklichkeit, Wirklichkeit is the creating energy that's always happening. That God is that creating energy, but not some God transcendent, distant from us, off in the heavens somewhere. The energy that flows through your life and through my life and through all life, that's God at work. And that's Wirklichkeit, is that reality of that creative working of the divine in us. And Eckhart would say, if you really understand what this means, you'll realize that you and God are not separate. That you are God. And that shocked then, as it shocks now. But Eckhart did not want to say that throws away all of the learnings of the church. He would say that interprets this long tradition in its truest and noblest form. So here we go. And let's start with a quote that some of you may have on a refrigerator magnet, the great source of wisdom. Right? I mean, it's true. I, we've lived in Germany now eight years, and I, for the first time I saw something on someone's refrigerator, but the Germans, the refrigerator in the car should not be tampered with. You don't put bumper stickers on cars. You certainly don't put things on the refrigerator. So when Germans visit us, they're always shocked at the clutter. And I'm sure your refrigerator is just like ours. Come on. Let's so here's a refrigerator magnet quote, which I hope by the end of the day will really will plumb the ab absolute startling truth and wisdom of this thing. The eye with which I see God is exactly the same eye with which God sees me. My eye and God's eye are one eye. One seeing, one knowing, and one loving. From one of the German sermons. It may be on your refrigerator magnet, but it is something that Eckhart actually wrote. Not everything on the refrigerator magnets is from the person attributed uh, to. But this one is. And it comes in the middle of a remarkable sermon in which Eckhart is describing what it is to realize that everything is ultimately one. If we started with that assumption in our lives, in our personal lives, with all the difficulties that each one of us face, in our political life, as a community, or as a nation, with all the tensions and divisions that we find ourselves embroiled in, it might shift something in us to realize that across our differences, across our divisions, <laughs> is a deeper unity. And we, uh, as people in this long wisdom tradition, some of us would root ourselves in Christianity, some here perhaps in Buddhism, in this deep wisdom tradition, that is the core truth at the beginning and end of everything. That all is yearning to, to come back to that oneness, to discover that lost oneness. And so this morning, or in this afternoon, our sessions, three sessions, you have a, a schedule of the day. We'll first look, we'll first introduce Eckhart, I will, talk a little bit about some of the central themes in Eckhart, and introduce his life. We'll take a short break, and we'll come back then for the first, second session this morning, and we'll look at the theme of one seeing. What does it mean to find our way to one seeing? So our eye, my eyes, and God's eyes are one eye. What does it mean this afternoon to come to that place of one knowing? And what does it mean to finally this afternoon come to that place of one loving? And all of this is a way of trying to simplify our lives. Trying to come to a place where we find courage. Heartfulness is what courage means, right? Cura, the heart core, from the Latin, to come to a heartful place of understanding our responsibility, and Eckhart would say that's exactly the right word, our ability to respond to the oneness of all being. And as, insofar as we can begin to do that, we can begin to take some of the edges out of our lives, and perhaps even offer to take some of the edges out of the places where we, where we are in discord with one another. 
And then this amazing quote. So these two quotes will anchor our day. Start with yourself and take leave of yourself. I love this quote. <laughs> and you know, it, it startles us because we, in this culture, unlike Eckhart's culture, we think that the whole point is to discover yourself, find yourself. And Eckhart would say it's not so easy because if you set off just to find yourself, what you're going to find is some illusion about who you think you should be or might be or could be or can't be or shouldn't be. All of these shoulds or shouldn'ts prevent you from seeing who you really are. So Eckhart would say, you have to take leave of yourself. And he used a word, he invented another word in, in German, Gelassenheit, Gelassenheit in modern German. Gelassenheit is letting be-ness, literally. It's sometimes translated as detachment. I think that's a bad translation because detachment means I'm pushing something away. I'm separating from it. Eckhart would say, let it be. And that great song that John Lennon made so famous, <laughs> Let It Be, is really an Eckhartian theme. Let it be. Let it be. If we can begin at that place, then a lot of things in our lives become somewhat easier, maybe a lot easier. Let it be. So, start with yourself and take leave of yourself. Examine yourself, and wherever you find yourself, then take leave of yourself. This is Eckhart. This is the best way of all. You should know that no one has ever renounced themselves so much in this life that there was nothing left of themselves to renounce. You know, that's not a bad way of thinking about it. And what Eckhart meant by that is, get rid of the baggage in your life that you think you need to hold on to to be who you are. Because it has usually nothing to do with who you are. All that baggage. And so we have new techniques of moving into this way of being mindfulness, meditation, uh, different kinds of traditions, not only in Buddhism, but in Christianity. A long tradition centering prayer, all kinds of paths that have been largely neglected in Protestantism for historical reasons, but that in the last generation, several generations, have become more and more primary for us as Protestants or as Christians or as people of other faiths or no faith. How do we come to this place? Eckhart would say it's not about what you believe. It's about what's real. It's not about what you believe. It's about what's real. And you should find beliefs that deepen your conviction about what is real. Not in general. In your life. And in my life. In our life. What is the real real? What is the real real? I remember when I was in seminary now many years ago in, at in Princeton, and a, a, an Orthodox theologian came from St. Vladimir's, Russian Orthodox Seminary along the Hudson River, Thomas Hopko, unforgettable. And he came in with a group of his seminarians, all dressed in black. They looked like they were from another world, and they were. But he said, you know, I was driving in today. This dates this story. All of you here will remember it. The, the motto for Coca-Cola used to be, Coke, it's, it's the real thing. And Hopko began, he was invited to give a lecture on Orthodox theology. There we all were waiting patiently for this wisdom from the Russian wisdom keeper. And he said, I went on our way from, from, uh, from northern New Jersey, we saw a sign, Coke, it's the real thing. And that, brothers and sisters, is a categorical lie because that has nothing to do with the real thing. That, what we're here for as human beings is to discover the real thing, and it's not Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't forgotten it. And in a way, that's Eckhart. He would say things like that to startle people, to outrage them, into thinking again about their lives. An amazing thinker. So this, this first session is going to be, I'm going to present Eckhart's life a little bit and uh, look at some of his central teachings. We'll take a short break, and then we'll start really seriously with Eckhart uh, in the break and after the break. So who is this man? He's a bit of a puzzle. We don't really know when he was born exactly, around 1260. You see, there were no birth records in the 13th century. There were parish records. Uh, usually of baptisms, but not of births. That was important. When you were born wasn't important. That you were baptized was important. 
But the churches, most of them, the records were destroyed either by worms or by fire or by violence uh, through the centuries. But we can reconstruct that he was probably born uh, in or around 1260 because of the dates of his studies, and that we know a little bit more about. We don't even know exactly when he died. Sometime in 1328, late in the year, and I'll tell you about how he got to that point uh, in a moment. Here's an image of Eckhart from the, here he is, Meister Eckhart. This is from the cathedral in Cologne, where he spent some years teaching and some years as a student. This is a modern uh, version because the Cologne was completely destroyed by incendiary bombs in 1943. And the Rod House, the city hall, when it was rebuilt, they placed on the Rod House, on the city hall, the central figures in the history of Cologne. And Eckhart certainly had to be there and is there. Here, with flames coming up uh, at his feet, with an open book, and with the, uh, in, in his mode as a preacher. OP means the order of preachers, the Ordo Predicatorum. And the order of preachers, for those of you who know a little bit about, about monastic orders, isn't really a monastic order, it's a mendicant order, it's a begging order. A new order founded at the beginning of the 13th century by St. Dominic, and they're usually called the Dominicans, or in Britain they're called the Black Friars, because they were friars, not monks, they were brothers. Uh, they lived in communities in towns and cities, unlike the Benedictines, Cistercians, Carthusians, who fled from, com, from the communities to find a, an isolated place in the desert, in the forest, where they wouldn't be disturbed, so they could pray. The Dominicans, Dominic had a charism to come to the people and to win them back to Christianity. He had a special concern about the Cathars, about these very radical religious people in the late 12th and early 13th centuries who had fallen from Catholicism and were cultivating their own symbol system, inventing their own sacraments, and for God's sake, allowing women to participate as leaders. And this was abhorrent to the church, all those things. And so Dominic thought the only way to win them back is not through uh, violence, but by persuasion. By persuading them from one's quality of life, living a simple life, a begging life, not accumulating property, dis dis uh, pulling away from the wealth of the church, and from preaching. The Franciscans are the second great mendicant order, founded about the same time, early in the 13th century. And Francis had a different charism. He really was a server, a servant of the people. He want, wanted to be with the poor, with the sick, with the marginalized, and to win them back through acts of kindness and charity and love. But these two great orders really reshaped Europe in the 13th and 14th centuries. And Eckhart, as a, from a noble family, uh, felt drawn as a young boy to the Dominicans. And he was probably the oldest son. We only know that because he was given the name of his father, who was Eckhart of Hochheim, a small town in Thuringen, in the uh, eastern part of Germany, in former East Germany. Uh, and either his older brothers died in childbirth, uh, or he was the oldest son who received, as was traditional, his father's name. He committed himself early on to the Dominican order, which was a learned order, which was, in that time, one of the great challenges uh, that, that you could imagine, was to join yourself to this remarkable group of committed people. During, by the time Eckhart came into, into, uh, into the world, the small order that had begun with Dominic had uh, increased to almost 30,000 friars all across Central, Central Europe, particularly. Here's an image of a Dominican teaching. Uh, we know that he's a Dominican from the habit that he's wearing, not the habits, like we think of habits, the habitus, the way he was attired. And it's a wonderful image because you see his students, they're all sitting with books. And he has an open book. Eckhart lectured every day from, as a professor when he was teaching at Paris, more on that in a moment, he taught the Bible every day, every morning, lecturing on the Bible. 
But for him, the Bible was was an open, it was a wilderness, an ocean of unplumbable depth, a wilderness of unimaginable mysteries and surprises and dangers, all of those things. And he probably, you know, I love this image. Here, here, this this one looks a little befuddled, doesn't he? This one is checking it out. He's saying it can't be true. This one seems to have been just surprised. His eyes are lighting up, and this one is riveted on the teacher's eyes. This is the relationship one longs for in life, and certainly as a teacher. Now, Eckhart has inspired art through the ages, and one of my favorite pieces is in the area of northern Bavaria, called Franken. It's an image of Meister Eckhart here on the our right with a woman. We don't know if she's a nun. She might have been. She might well have, might well have been a Beguine. Beguines were a group of women who lived in communities uh, and took no, no lifelong vows. They worked. They earned their own money. You could say they were the first Virginia Woolf, a room of their own. <laughs> And they, they did have a priest who would come to celebrate the sacraments in their chapel with them. And Eckhart spent the last 15 years of his life doing just that in Strasbourg, in the city of Strasbourg, at that time a German city uh, along the, the Rhine River. Now, of course, it's a French city. And what are they doing? They're looking together. I just, I love this image. That, you know, it's not Eckhart teaching this woman what she needs to know. They're both looking together with her hands and his on the book itself. Looking deeply into the book. And here is what the book <coughs> says. This is a quote from Eckhart. The most important hour is always the present. The most significant person is always the one facing you. The most needed work is always love. Die wichtigste Stunde ist immer die Gegenwart. Der bedeutendste Mensch ist immer der, der dir gerade gegenübersteht. Das Notwendigste ist immer die Liebe. And these hands tell the whole story. So here's the town he went to as a young man, about 20 miles from Hochheim. A town at that time of 20,000 people, which was a fairly large town for Europe, but not, not the largest. Paris was already a town of two, city of two, 200,000. But it was a large city, it was a walled city, and uh, it was a city with many churches. Each of the orders had their own church in all of the towns and cities of Europe. And here we have, in modern day, really the city doesn't look much different, the Severus, Severi Kirche here, and St. Mary's, the cathedral church, right next to it. And the Dominican church is over along the wall. It was a later church that was built. Uh, it's still there today. And indeed, it was the first church in Erfurt to join itself to the Protestant Reformation. Erfurt, after all, if you know a little bit about Church history, um, well, you might need to know a lot about church history for this, but this is where Martin Luther studied in Erfurt. He didn't study with the Dominicans. He was an Augustinian, and his house would have been back here. It's destroyed in the war and partially rebuilt. But Eckhart's church was not destroyed. It was one of the few churches that was spared in the bombing of 1944. And in fact, you can visit it today if you're in Erfurt and go to Protestant services there. It looks much as it did in Eckhart's day. It's been beautifully restored. The dormitory where Eckhart would have slept is still there with its wooden exposed beams. The refectory is still there. The library is still there. And of course, the church is still there. This is the town that Eckhart knew like the back of his hand. He went to, to study here and eventually left Erfurt for Cologne but came back then, after a period of studies, to be the prior, that is, the overseer of this community of about 50 friars, uh, as a young man in his mid-20s. It's quite startling. So most of the friars would have been much older than he was, but they recognized 
not simply his genius, but his talent, his administrative talent, his, his pastoral talent of working with people, uh, which is one of the central things that anyone in, a, in spiritual leadership has to be able to do. To have, to be able to work with people, not just to teach them, but to help them find wisdom themselves and learn to learn from each other. We left Erfurt and headed off to Cologne, which was the largest German city at the time, about 45,000. If you've been to Cologne, then you'll recognize here the Great Cathedral, which is right on the central square, in fact, right next to the train station. And uh, this church is not quite in its shadow, but almost. This part of the church, by the way, was only built in the 19th century of the, of the cathedral in Cologne. It was a very small church uh, in Eckhart's day. And this one wouldn't have been all that much uh, smaller, actually. St. Andrew's Church, which is about a five-minute block from the cathedral. It's the place where one of the greatest theologians of Eckhart's day is buried. So if you go to the crypt, you'll find the burial place of Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus, or Albert the Great, one of the great teachers, Dominican teachers of the uh, 13th century. He died in 1280. So it's not certain that Eckhart would have studied with him, but he probably met him before the old man's death. From there, he uh, eventually ended up in Paris, where he began his formal theological studies. He studied the arts, his bachelor's degrees in Erfurt and in Cologne, and then was invited, uh, as only two Dominicans were allowed to be invited, to study at the university in, uh, in Paris. So-called the Jacobin Church, the Church of Saint-Jacques in Paris, it destroyed, uh, actually, by the revolution, the French Revolution, that is. The French don't have to call it the French Revolution. They just call it the Revolution. <laughs> um, and why Saint-Jacques? Who is Saint-Jacques? It's the road from Paris leading south to Santiago. It was the pilgrim's path from one of the great centers of Northern Europe, perhaps the, gr the greatest center of Northern Europe, all the way to Santiago. So that path was called the Jacobs, Jakobsweg in German, Jacobs or, or um, uh, James, St. James path. And it went, here it is, Saint Jacques, and this is the Dominican Priory in the so called Latin Quarter, the left bank. Why the Latin Quarter? That's where all of the uh, schools were and where the university, therefore, emerged as a kind of conglomerate of all of these teaching schools from all the religious orders. So it came to be called the Latin Quarter. Why the Latin Quarter? Because that's where people spoke. I mean, there were Germans there, Germanic people there, there were Frank, French speakers there, there were English speakers there. Uh, there. There was no, the only common language of theology was Latin. And, and Latin was a living language. That is, it wasn't the language that people spoke in the streets, but it was a language of the church, it was a language of commerce, it was a language of, of government, uh, it was the learned language, but it was in, in, in inflected in a modern form. It grew and changed over the millennia, just as every other language would do. It had one big advantage, though. The Bible had been translated into Latin already in the early centuries, and that put a certain kind of break, B-R-A-K-E, on the development of the language. The patterns of, the, of, of Anselm's... Uh, 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 um, the tra early translation of the Bible uh, remained a kind of uh, bedrock for the way Latin developed as a language through the centuries. So he's there twice, um, as a, once as a student, and he's the, one of only two Dominicans to, to be, be invited back twice to teach there. There was no tenure for life in that day. You were tenured for a, for a period of several years by your order. The only other theologian, Dominican, who had received this great honor before him was the great Thomas Aquinas, who died in 1274. Possible that they would have known each other, but quite unlikely, because uh, Eckhart would have been a young boy, and Eckhart never traveled that far to the west, and uh, Aquinas never traveled in the, that part of eastern Germany. 
the last part of his life was lived in Strasbourg, a German city then. And it is also today's Protestant church, the Temple Temple Neuf, the new temple of the new church. Uh, new because it was newer than many of the older churches in Strasbourg. Here it is. This is the Dominican cloister and the Dominican church. And you see here the cathedral in the distance. Uh, it was sadly burned also in the, um, not in the revolution, but in the Franco-Prussian War. So in the late 19th century, the war that gave birth to Germany as a nation. The church was completely destroyed and rebuilt, much in the way that it would have looked in Eckhart's day. For the last 15 years of his life or so, he lived there. And at the very end of his life, he had to return to Cologne, where he may have had occasional teaching bouts, stints, we don't quite know, because he was accused of heretical teaching by two Franciscans. And, you know, you have to understand that there was great rivalry between these two great mendicant orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans. They were like the two big forces in towns and cities, and, and tremendous rivalry. Why a rivalry? Well, because they were established as the first extra parochial orders. What does that mean? It meant that they were papal orders, they were uh, commissioned by the Pope to deliver pastoral care regardless of parish boundaries. That was a startling innovation and a radical one. I would say it, it was the beginning of pastoral care as we know it in the Western Church. Why? Because the parish priest, whether in a town, a village, or in the country, up until that point, knew that if you wanted to be baptized, if you wanted to receive the sacraments, if you wanted to um, have a burial, you had to come to him because of where you lived. The parish was a geographical boundary, right? You, you couldn't go to the next parish just because you liked the priest over there or because the priest in your parish didn't like you. <laughs> well, having these extra parochial churches meant that people could say, you know what? My priest is a lecher. He's just ignorant. He can hardly even read the Mass. But that Dominican priest, oh, he's special. He's, he's something. Or that Franciscan priest, he's really ministering the way I think ministry should be done. And you can imagine this created for the first time a kind of competition in the towns around pastoral care. You know, much we take it for granted as Americans. So you don't like the pastor? Try the one next door. You know, you have a fight with, with your your deacons, or they have a fight with you, or consistory, whatever you call it. Hey, there's another church across the green. Let's try them. That might be a good place to go, right? Well, that would have been an innovation in the 13th century. And it created a space. For the first time, people were really, they had to attend to how they were preaching. Because if they were lousy, People voted with their feet, as we say, right? They would go to the Franciscans to hear Richard Rohr, or some version of Richard Rohr. I would too, right? Or they would go to the Dominicans to hear some version of, who knows, Teilhard de Jardin. He's a, he's a Jesuit, but they would go to places where there was somebody compelling, right? Somebody who addressed them in a way that brought them alive. And that was Eckhart's vocation. He, he was an, a, a remarkably learned man, but he saw his whole life work as that of reaching people for the truth of the gospel. And he meant that in the deepest and widest way imaginable, to awaken people to their God-given vocation, to empower them, not by telling them they had to come to the church, but by telling them they had to find the divine within themselves. And once they found the divine within themselves, they would be bold, bold enough to look for the divine in their neighbor, in their friend, and in their enemy. Sounds a little like what Jesus was talking about, doesn't it? I mean, it's an ancient wisdom that being religious is not about being in a cool community with a sexy music program and a great pastoral a preacher lucky if you have those things, but that's not the heart of it. The heart of it is those things serving you to discover the divine within yourself 
within others, within the world as a whole, where God is already at the beginning. That is what we're about today for this amazing Maestra Eckhart. Now, these Franciscans went to their bishop, who happened to also be a Franciscan, in Cologne, and said, this guy's teaching stuff that's dangerous. We think it's heretical. Check it out. The bishop checked it out and said, I agree with you. I condemn these 28 propositions ascribed to Eckhart. And they were all from his writings, from his published writings, which means manuscripts, handwritten texts that were beginning to circulate in increasing numbers in the Europe of that day. But imagine if somebody took, well, we're hearing it again in this political season, they take one sentence that you say, one word that you say, in some unguarded moment, or totally out of context, and suddenly you sound like an absolute moron. <laughs> you know? But maybe you were quoting somebody. You might have been ar actually arguing against that. But there it is in your writings. You can, you, can you imagine that? Well, Eckhart was furious with this. He felt it was completely unjustified. He appealed the sentence, the censure, all the way to the papacy. And where was the papacy in Eckhart's last life? Well, it wasn't in Rome, but in Avignon, Avignon in France. And so off he goes to Avignon, walking. Dominicans were not allowed to fly or take the train. <laughs> they weren't allowed to ride horses. They had to walk. He walked all the way. He walked across Europe a dozen times, at least. We know that. It would have taken from Erfurt to Paris about five or six weeks if the weather cooperated, if you weren't beaten and robbed. Uh, and they always went with nothing, taking nothing with them. They were mendicants. They begged all the way, begged for a place to stay, begged for their food, all the way across the forested uh, reaches of Europe. And he walked all the way with two of his confreres, all the way to Avignon to defend himself in the papal court in Avignon. Which, if you've been to Avignon, this is the city as it looked in the late Middle Ages, and it actually hasn't changed at all. This is the great papal palace in Avignon, as it looks today, a walled city, a fortress, really. And they needed to be a fortress because the French king had brought the pope, really by force, to Avignon. And um, this was a tremendous crisis for Europeans because you can't take the Pope out of Rome. <laughs> you can't take Rome out of the Pope either. <laughs> and that was a bit, a bit of a problem late in the century. Uh, in 1378, a second Pope was duly consecrated in Rome. So for a period of about 40 years, there were two Popes, both duly consecrated by Cardinals both claiming to be the true pope. And this was a tremendous, this is after Eckhart's death, but a tremendous problem, crisis, because if the pope was illegitimate, then your bishop was illegitimate, then your priest was illegitimate, then the sacraments you received were not legitimate. It was a tremendous crisis. And of course, neither of them wanted to stand down. They both hung on, to remind you of the sort of political season, <laughs> they both hung on, for their own life, for their own privilege, for their own power. Uh, and really, it was a devastating blow for European Christianity. That's after Eckhart's time. But during Eckhart's time, the Pope was in France. Eckhart went to defend himself. He did defend himself. Uh, we have actually a record of his defense. We have the 28 Theses. We have his defense, which is remarkably moving. He was compelling. Uh, and there was finally a verdict rendered uh, in 1329, in which um, 18, 11 of the uh, theses were considered to be uh, heretical, and uh, 17 of them were considered to be dubious and dangerous. So he, he didn't lose everything. But he was, he, was, he was dead by then. He must have died after he left Avignon. We don't know where he died. We don't know when he died. And 
as is perhaps befitting a theologian of his stature and of his complexity, we don't even know where he's buried. He remains hidden to us, a mysterious vanishing. And there's something, if you, by the end of the day, I think you'll, help, you'll understand a little bit more about why there's something very fitting about that. Because he didn't want to figure out where things were. He didn't want to figure out exactly where God was. Because he knew that God was everywhere. And I suppose, in a sense, the fact that here in Camden, Maine, almost a hundred of you have come to, uh, to immerse yourself in his thought for a day, he's here among us now. He's here in, in this distant place, far from his birth place and far from his death place. And that's what wisdom does. It brings us to that kind of place. So we're moving a little bit faster than I imagined. So I want to uh, close here. by sketching the rest of the day, and then we'll take a short break, so we'll move things forward a little bit and have a little bit more time for the first session, which is terrific. Actually, are there questions about Eckhart's life before we I sketch the day? And there, there are pieces, of half sheets of paper. You can use that to keep notes. Uh, you can use that to pass notes to your neighbor if you want. If you want to ask a question and you don't want to stand up in front of the group, just write it down and put it up on the podium, and I'll address those questions uh, as, as is fitting during the day. But are there particular questions about Eckhart, his life? Yes? I'm a little confused about uh, his relationship with Erfurt. I'm a little confused about his relationship with Erfurt. He was there early, yes. studying and all. Then he seemed to leave. You said he came back at some point. Yes. So was there a lot of back and forth? Yes, thank you. That's helpful. There was. He was first of all the prior in Erfurt, and then he was uh, head of a province, Dominican province, first uh, called Teutonia, which was the northern, the Baltic states, and sort of the, you know, the Prussia, Prussia, the later Prussia, the northern part of Germany and Poland. But he probably lived in Erfurt and traveled through the province, uh, adjudicating disputes, property disputes, um, uh, author issues of, of, of conflict with noble nobility and so forth. We don't exactly know where he lived all of the time, but up until he uh, finally moved to Strasbourg, Erfurt was more or less his home, with two interludes in Paris. So he was in Paris for about two years, uh, 1302 to 1304, I think, and 1311 to 1313. And then at that point, he was called to Strasbourg, in part to live in Strasbourg, to preach there regularly, and to work with these, uh, the Beguine community, communities of the free spirit, as some of them were called. And um, it was a remarkable ministry because the, the Beguines, as I mentioned earlier, were very problematic to the authorities. First of all, they were women who assumed their own authority. And in the 13th century, as in the 21st century, that's not always looked upon kindly, right? A woman who raises her voice in a political debate is called, well, by things words I'm not going to use today. A man who shouts in a political debate today is called assertive, assertive. assertive you know, no one would say he was too assertive, but you'll hear people say she was too assertive. This is, come on, this is 700 years later. So it was a big issue then, and Eckhart probably spent a lot of his time uh, visiting with these women. They had jobs, they supported themselves, they lived uh, often in, if you've been to, if you've been to Belgium, if you've been to Bruges, or to Amsterdam, the Beguinages, have any of you traveled in those cities? The Beguinage, Begin, little communities cloistered together, little houses, where women would have lived together around a chapel, would have worked there, and would have had their life there, their common life, life there. Well, Eckhart spent years, the last part of his life, probably never in Erfurt. He probably never went back to Erfurt. He was too busy in Strasbourg, and as a provincial of a larger province, which included now the part of southern Germany uh, and into Switzerland. So he traveled a lot, and uh, it's clear he would have walked everywhere. And he would have taken with him what he could. Probably um, a, a copy of 
the, what he was writing, what he was working on, perhaps a Bible, we don't really know. He would have presumably stayed then in Dominican houses along the way, where he would have been given a warm welcome, uh, as was befitting his responsibility. So Alfred, the first part of his life as a student, later as a prior, and finally as a provincial of, to, of, of uh, the Saxon region. Yes? Was he ever placed in any kind of restriction when he was at Avion defending his thesis? Was he placed in a restriction? I'm just going to repeat the questions. Was he placed in a restriction in Avignon? No, he would not have been. He wasn't a criminal. He wasn't silenced by the church, or he wasn't? No, he wasn't silenced by the church. And in fact, he, he was never declared a heretic. 28 propositions were declared to be heretical or suspicious. 11 heretical, 17 suspicious. But that meant that he was a dubious figure in the centuries immediately following his, his death. Interestingly, what happened was people continued to write treatises drawing on his thought, uh, not using his name. Yeah? So quietly, his wisdom did continue, but uh, it was a, an anonymous kind of, of uh, message and movement. Yes? Was there any thought that after he left Avignon that he was disappeared? Was there any thought that after he left Avignon that he was disappeared? I don't really know. No records suggest that. It's plausible that he was um, killed. It wouldn't have been unknown then as now. You take care of people who are too radical, dangerous. too dangerous. Yeah, it's a wonderful book if you're looking to read something further on him by Joel Harrington called "Dangerous Mystic" on Meister Eckhart. And uh, Eckhart would have, wouldn't have, would not have called himself a mystic, and he, he might have said, "I'm dangerous because Christianity is dangerous." He might have said, "Yes, you're right. I am dangerous. These propositions are dangerous because they're going to challenge your comfortable assumptions." your small world. They're going, to they're going to demand that you live into a larger, more generous world. They're going to demand that. And if that's what dangerous is, then I'm on the side of dangerous. Uh, I, I can imagine hearing Richard Rohr say that very same thing. Right? That if you want to be faithful to a gospel of love in a time of division and with great hatred and animosity, let's just say animosity, then, in fact, the gospel of love is a dangerous gospel. And uh, in a sense, I would say, all of our churches should be places where there's danger afoot. Where we are seeking together to be challenged to a deeper life, to a nobler life. Where the highest goal is not to honor one particular teaching or, or one particular nation but to think in kingdom terms, as Jesus would have said. To think of the, the reign of God, not the reign of Caesar. Right? I say that, mindful that I'm behind me is an American flag, as there are in most churches. It, the Germans, when they visit the United States and see American flags in our sanctuaries, are shocked. Because they know what, what happened when the flag was brought into their churches in the 1930s. And you will never ever find a German flag in a German church today. Never. 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 It's not to say there's anything wrong with the flag. But there is something wrong to a blind obedience to the flag above all else. And in that sense, the church is a dangerous place because we remember that our allegiance to the divine is deeper and more important than any other human allegiance. Eckhart will find a metaphoric way of speaking of that by saying we have to dispel all the creaturely within us, all the creatures within us. That sounds strange, like he's against nature. No, he's not against nature. He's saying everything comes from God, everything. But the things that you hold within yourself that you think are absolute are not absolute. The only absolute is the oneness of love. That's absolute. Everything else, everything else is up for grabs. Everything else flows from that. Everything else depends upon that. And to be a true patriot or a true citizen for Eckhart 
would have meant finding, committing yourself to the oneness of love at the heart of all reality, including your nation, your neighborhood, your city, your town, your family, all those things. It's a, it's a marvelous vision, and it, it is a dangerous vision. So was he silenced? No. And he left not having been condemned. He left having made his case. The jury, the papal jury, is in deliberation now. Uh, and eventually, four, five months after the trial in March, the trial was, I think, in November 1328, uh, the verdict is rendered, and Eckhart was not alive to receive it. Yes, in the very back. Carrie. Um, the, the, one of those first images you showed of Eckhart reading from the Bible and the three readers. Yes. He was 25. It seems to me, is it possible that the one on the left hand side and upper was, in fact, a woman? Absolutely, was a woman. Address. She is a woman. Maybe you said that. Nicely. Yeah. We don't know if she was a, a, a Dominican a nun. Could have been. Probably not from the dress. More like, likely she was a Beguine. So she had a very simple dress on. It wasn't a, a peasant dress or a commoner's dress. It was a, a dress of someone in religious life, probably a Beguine. These um, unvowed women, well, they had a vow. They had a temporary vow to their community and a permanent vow to God. Uh, and, and he spent a lot of time counseling them, talking with them, preaching in their churches. And they came to hear him preach. He was a magnetic preacher, and I hope you'll by the end of the day, realized a little bit more why one can say that, um, but uh, difficult, demanding. In fact, one of the reasons that John Sweeney and I undertook to write these now two books, we have a third one just beginning, we're writing letters now, Eckhart's Letters to the Perplexed. That's the tentative title, Meister Eckhart's Letters to the Perplexed. There was a, a, a famous Jewish theologian in the middle, in Eckhart's time, Maimonides, who wrote, a treatise for the perplexed. So we're writing a version of that. And, you know, I think in a way Eckhart would say, it's good to be perplexed about the right thing. It, it's a good thing to be confused about the right thing. So, begins probably. Can you just repeat what her question was? The question was, uh, was that a woman? Uh, the, the one on the left, was it a woman? And the answer is clearly yes. It was a woman, probably a begin, could have been a common woman. What I love about the image is how close they are, and, and the center of attention is not each other. It's their common pursuit of wisdom in the book. She meant the other image, I think, the woodcut. The first one, ah, the woodcut. woodcut. Black and white. Probably not. I'd, I'd have but to go back and look. The headdress is long, and the, and the other two oh. men, they have their shortened. That would have been utterly shocking uh, for the time. Probably, I'll go back and look. Probably not only because uh, education was still so directly, uh, radically separated. Now, the, why were the monasteries, the convents, the monasteries for women, the convents, so popular in the Middle Ages, and uh, really up until recent time, and still very popular in large parts of the world? It was the, the only place women could, could find a place of their own, where they could be learned, where they could be students where they could cultivate their own life. Hildegard of Bingen, we'll probably do another day on Hildegard in the fall, Hildegard wrote music for her nuns, wrote theater pieces for her nuns to perform for each other, and that was very common in monasteries, convents, up until the 20th century. These women who were completely segregated. See, the Dominican men were out doing pastoral work. The women weren't allowed to. They were cloistered. They were radically cloistered. They couldn't leave the monastery. And if you go to a cloistered convent today, let's say a Carmelite, a, 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 a reformed Carmelite community, often you can't even see them at prayer. In St. Hildegard's monastery in Germany, up above the Rhine River, above Rudesheim, it's not the monastery that she founded, which was on the other side of the river. It was a monastery built in the early 20th century, which took her name, St. Hildegard. Hildegard, now she is St. Hildegard. Um, there, the, monast the monastic church is in an L shape, and you hear the women with the altar in the in the. In, you see, if you can see what I'm, this, here's 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 where the people would come to, to listen, and participate in, in the altars in the front, and the women are sitting on the left. You can't see them. There are 60 women there singing. It's heavenly. 
you're, you're in this Art Deco church, one of the most uh, remarkable painted churches uh, of Germany by a distinguished Bavarian painter who came and finished all the murals. So you, you're in this beautiful uh, cl uh, church, monastic church, with all of these women, the story of Hildegard on one side and all of the famous Benedictine women on the other, but you hear them. So it's, it would have been unlikely, it's a long answer to your short question, unlikely that women would have been able to hear him <coughs> teaching, to hear him preaching, yes. The church was open to <coughs> men and to women, uh, but that was an image of a teacher and not the image of a preacher. Yes, John. Mark, this was before the printing press. Yes. Um, and so how was his, um, his teachings kept, how were his teachings kept alive when the church was thinking that his teachings were heretical? Yeah, this is before the printing press, which comes around 1450, so 120 years after his death. How did, how did his teaching stay alive? Well, through manuscripts, through hand. Manuscript is a handwritten text. Manus is the hand, and scribo is to write. A manuscript is a handwritten text. They would have been written on parchment, most of them. Very, very um, uh, important things would be written on vellum. Well, what is vellum? Yeah, skins. My, my, my thinking was, if the church is, is against his teaching, how, does, how is it kept alive within, yes. the, within the community? Well, that's the, 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 a lot of his texts were circulated anonymously. Or they were hidden. That is, monasteries had them, friaries had them, but they did not uh, announce that they had them. There was no card catalog you could come and look under E. <laughs> Eckhart. Ah, you've got these texts of Eckhart. Now, they would have been kept secret, because if a papal inquisitor came, a visitor came, a visitor was not a good thing. The visitor would come to check out that things were going as they should. You did not want them to know that you had heretical texts. Another woman, we'll probably do a session a day on, maybe in the fall or spring next year, is Julian of Norwich. Mm -hmm. Julian's bishop was so severe that if someone was suspected of heresy, they could be tried and burned at the stake. He, was, he loved, he was known loved. He was an avid burner of heretics. And she, her little church, which was called St. Julian's, is right down the street from the Lollard Pit, why, what was the Lollard pit? It was a big pit where they dragged the Lollards, the Wycliffeites, and burned them. So she would have been smelling this bishop's dastardly work. So how did they, how did they survive? They probably would have been hidden, kept anonymously, or just kept very quietly. Eckhart was only really discovered in the 19th century, a, gr a period of great historical work of recovering uh, traditions, texts and traditions that had been largely lost in monastic libraries or neglected and, um, and really proliferated then in the 20th century. So it's only in the last 100 years or so that there's been this resurgent, resurgent interest in, I would call them boundary theologians like Eckhart. Let's not use the word mystic at the moment. People really thought that the only way to be faithful was to be on the boundaries and point to the center from a very different place. Uh, and that resurgent, resurging interest has brought people like Eckhart back into the mainstream. Yeah. Yes? Was there any sense that when um, um, Eckhart was accused of, of heresy that in some sense he welcomed that as a way to uh, you know, kind of cause dissonance yeah, good question. Is there any sense that he would have welcomed being called a heretic? And the simple answer is absolutely no, because this would silence him forever, and it would make him su suspect. And he wanted to say, yes, I'm a dangerous thinker. He wouldn't have used those words. He would have said, yes, I'm, I'm a radical thinker, but the radicality of my thought, radus, is the root. I'm going to the root of wisdom. And if that root is considered dangerous, then so be it. Then let it be a dangerous wisdom. But it is the real thing. This is the real thing. This is what you need to attend to. So he would have resisted that. Today, someone like Matthew Fox could say, ah, you know, the church wants to, you, Matthew Fox was a Dominican until he was silenced by Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, later Pope Benedict XVI. So Matthew Fox left the Dominican order, left the Catholic 
Catholic Church, became an Episcopalian, Episcopal priest. I don't know that he still practices as an Episcopal priest. But um, uh, he welcomed it because he was, t Matthew Fox, was tired of a church that refused to face the deeper truth that it did not want to acknowledge. But for Eckhart, this would have been catastrophic, and he felt it was wrong. Nothing that he taught, he felt, was unbiblical or out of step with the deep tradition. Nothing. And so he fought it and, and sought to, in a way, clarify not simply why his thought was permissible, but why his thought was necessary. And I think that's a good place to... Let me just sh sketch today and take a break. Deep simplicity. Uh, in the next session, we'll talk about one seeing and we'll really look at the theme of radiance. Eckhart used a little word, Frunklein, a little spark. He said there's a spark of God in everyone, in everyone, in everything, and in everyone. And our work is to find that spark. I cannot find it in my neighbor if I don't know about it in myself. So my first work is to find it in myself so that I can begin to find it in others. And for Eckhart, that meant finally becoming God. And we'll see what that meant by the end of the session. Second, this afternoon, one knowing. And there the theme is emptiness. Very countercultural. We think about filling things up. We're, we're a consumer society. How much can we take in? Eckhart would say, no. The real question is letting go. The word he invented is Gelassenheit. I mentioned it earlier. Letting Venus. And here we're going to talk about emptiness. How emptiness for him is our primary pursuit letting go, emptying the mind, emptying ourselves of all that we think we know, all that we thought we needed to make room for what is essential. And then finally, at the end of the afternoon, one loving, and here the theme is creativity. How can we become creative people? How can we be people who see our life? I'm not saying going out and learning how to paint watercolors. Maybe that's an expression of your creativity. But Eckhart would have said, that's, that's, only, uh, that's only, how to say, an outward thing. He's talking about the deep creativity of seeing your life as the place where God, the divine, is creating. Right now, right here, in you and among us. So we'll take a deep, a short break and then put on your seatbelts and we'll take a look. <laughs>